Good morning, man of Bible Baptist. Praise the Lord. This is a great morning. Amen. Amen. It is a privilege to be back here. I was here, we're debating whether it was two or three years ago, but it is a joy to worship with you this morning. This has been a worship experience, and uh, through song, through dance, through yelling out, <laughs> through everything, and, and I am joining with you in that. It, it, it is indeed we need to be worshiping machines. You know, I, we all get tired and we get this and we get that, and then we come here and it starts working the way it should. And, you know, I'm trying to, Lord, wake me up, energize me, you know, fill us with your spirit. And, and it is good to do that together. I thank you for that very gracious introduction. I enjoyed your pastor on the few times that our paths have crossed. We just had lunch together with some other brothers about a few weeks ago. Amen. And it was good to reconnect and to realize, oh, we're going to see each other so soon again in the church. And as he said, through motion, through voice, through all the senses, God would have us worship him. And as we go through a traditional Passover setting this morning, you're going to see how God is a God of show and tell. Amen. He wants us to smell things and wake up and worship Him. He wants us to touch things and to see things and even hear things sometimes. All our senses He gave us through which we can approach Him and get to know Him more. Well, this is a, this is a special season. And today is a special day as we begin this week of walking with Jesus. And we get to Friday to when he was crucified. And then we get to Sunday when he was raised from the dead. And in between there, in between there, he had this special meal with his, with his buddies, with his disciples. He had that Passover meal as we read about this morning on Thursday night. Well, you couldn't be here Thursday night, so we're doing it this morning. <laughs> All right. And I hope that you will see as we go through this a picture of his death, his resurrection, and the promise of his return. If you've got a Bible with you, turn with me to Luke 22. We're going to read just a few verses from Luke as he repeats uh, or tells in his own way what we heard a little bit in one of the other Gospels this morning. But Luke chapter 22, we're just going to set... <clears throat> Set the, uh, the context a little bit. Luke 22. And again, to repeat, in Luke's version, what we heard, we're going to start with verse 7, where it says, Then came the first day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go, prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. In verse 13, they left and found everything just as he had told them. And they did. They prepared the Passover. Now the first night of Passover begins a week-long holiday that we just mentioned here in the text called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And during that time we eat nothing that contains any leaven or yeast in it. By the way, do you know when Passover starts this year? Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night is the, the first night of the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We eat no leaven because throughout Scripture, leaven is frequently used as a symbol of sin. In olden times, they would take a small piece and use it to ferment the entire portion of dough. Obviously, what does the leaven do? Well, that bread starts to rise to become puffed up. What does sin do in our lives? Oh, yeah, I'm number one. <laughs> it puffs up us, us up with a little bit of pride and arrogance. So during this week, we eat no leaven as a way of saying we want to break that cycle of sin in our lives. And that's why in some Orthodox Jewish homes for up to six weeks before the holiday, they've already been working, doing a complete spring cleaning, removing all the cakes, the cookies, the breads, the cereals, the Twinkies, the Ho-Hos, anything. Even that ice cream that has little cookie bits in it, you know, it's got to go. Now, once the house has been cleansed, 
the home is ready for the celebration to begin. And it's a very joyful holiday. Lots of singing. The kids are a big part of it. It's, it's like I said, it's filled with praise. But my ancestors had to, instruct, had to eat that first Passover meal a little differently. Loin skirted, sandals on their feet and staves in hand, ready to go at a moment's notice. But as I said today, it's different. Today we actually recline on pillows as we eat. We relax. We get to kind of slouch over. And Sir, I am glad you are on the spirit of things this, this morning. That's good. All right. A few of us. Well, you know, in ancient Middle Eastern societies, the reason we do that, it was only the free who could recline at dinner, only the redeemed. Now, in a, a traditional Jewish home, if you were to go, what did you say, north of Northern Parkway? That's right. Yeah, if you go into some of those neighborhoods on Passover, you would see some of those fellas wearing one of these. It's called a kittle, and uh, it's the kind of robe that uh, a priest might have worn in Old Testament times. Now, the way I grew up, we weren't that traditional. It was a traditional Jewish home, but my dad didn't wear one of these. I suppose his dad probably did. But my father was a little more modern. He said, ah, enough of the old world. Well, I'm sure you know what this is, right? Did you say the beanie? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's right. It's the yarmulke or kippah. Jewish men often cover their heads as a sign of respect before God. I'm sure you see that around here. But on Passover, we wear something a whole lot more special. Yeah, kind of looks like a, a crown that a king might wear. Because on Passover, the head of the house is like a priest, like a king. And as he fills those roles, he guides his family through this traditional Passover Seder. Seder is a word that means order. It's a Hebrew word. And uh, everything has an order that we follow in this book. We call a Haggadah, which means the telling. Let everybody take a look. Inside, lots of instructions. It tells the story as we follow it along through pictures and words of how God redeemed the Jewish people from slavery in Egypt. All right. Well, there's a customary greeting. We start at, we're actually supposed to yell this into the neighborhood. I made my daughters do this when they were little. They're a little bit embarrassed to do it, but let all who are hungry come and eat. Amen. That's what you think. <laughs> There's nothing here. For, <laughs> all right. We ain't eating this morning. But just the same, the invitation stands. Come celebrate Passover, and we begin with the lighting of the Passover candles. It's usually the honor of the woman of the house to do that. It would be nice sometime if my wife were up here with me. But uh, this morning, she, uh, we were on the road for the last few days, uh, quite a long drive, and uh, she didn't want to get up quite so early and join me, so I'll take the honors. After lighting them, <clears throat> all right. After lighting them, <clears throat> she recites a traditional Hebrew blessing that goes like this: Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam, Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotav V'Tzivanu Lahadlik Ner Shel Yom Tov. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the Universe, who has set us apart with your commandments and commanded us to kindle these festival lights. You know why it's nice that a woman would kindle these lights normally, not a man? Because it can remind us, if we think about it, that the Messiah, the light of the world, would not come from the seed of man, but from the seed of woman and by the will of God. Even as Isaiah the prophet foretold, you remember? Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. She shall call his name Emmanuel, a light to light the Gentiles, praise the Lord, and the glory of thy people Israel. But Passover is not just a simple meal. Mm -mm. It's a big banquet, and it's not just a weekly type worship service. It's a very complicated annual ceremony. So where a normal meal and service might take one or two hours, the Passover celebration may take up to four hours. And thank you, Pastor David, for telling me to not worry about time this morning. All right. <laughs> well, during that time, each adult would drink from his cup and refill it four times. The first one, now, we don't normally have four cups in front of each person. I have these two help us remember the meaning of each cup. Normally we would have one that we keep refilling. The first one is called the Kiddush cup, cup of sanctification. Then is the cup of deliverance or plagues, two names for it. Then the cup of redemption, which is a special one, and we'll talk more about this one. Lastly is the cup of Hallel or the cup of praise. 
Well, with the first one, the father lifts the cup aloft, so does the family joins him. We offer praise and thanks to God Almighty, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam borei pri hagafen. You want to know something? It, in, in, in the church, when we pray, if I was going to pray in the church, I would make my prayer and I would say, Amen. Right? We all say, Amen. amen. In Judaism, it's a little different. Whoever says the blessing doesn't say the Amen. It's just the people listening in say the Amen. So I didn't say the Amen. Let me hear you say the Amen. amen. All right. <laughs> well, now we've officially begun. And the youngest person present comes forward to ask the meaning of Passover. It would be a little boy or a little girl. And the reason is this. He or she, by asking these questions, what is this for? How come we do that? What's that about? It sets up the evening and allows the parents the old, or the grandparents, the older generation, to pass on the meaning to the children of the good things God has done through history and how he's redeemed our people. So from generation to generation, we, we, we celebrate the holiday that way. And so the child asked the first one, Ma nishtana halayla hazeh, mi kol halaylot, mi kol halaylot, which means simply, why is this night different than any other night? Well, we begin to explain. This is because of what the Lord did for me. When he brought me out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, when he redeemed me with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. If you remember anything about Passover once I'm gone, and so you can talk about it maybe with some of your neighbors, I want you to remember at least one word. The word redemption. All right? Let's say redemption. redemption. That'll help us remember. All right. Because that's what this holiday is all about but not just God's message of redemption. God, with this holiday, gave us his means of redemption yeah. through the sacrifice of a Passover lamb. Yeah. My ancestors were told to take a spotless lamb, roast it whole without breaking any of its bones, and then put its blood up on the door frames of our homes, the lintel on top, and then on the two side posts. Well, it was through our obedience to God's command and through our faith in the effectiveness of what he had provided just think, we could have chosen to not believe it. What? Blood on my door? I'm not doing that. Well, that wouldn't have gone so well for us. So it was through obedience and faith that we were spared the destruction of that tenth plague which fell in the land of Egypt. For when the Lord saw the blood on our doors, he caused death to pass yeah, over. That's it. It's where we get the name of the holiday. Passover in Hebrew, Pesach. The holiday we remember that death passed over the houses of Israel because of the blood the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb. This is a tremendous act of God's redemption. But I want you to see, it's more than that. It's God's picture of an even greater redemption that was to come through the sacrifice of another Passover lamb, our Messiah Jesus. Think about it. You all know what the Torah is, right? It's the law of Moses. Well, God had Moses insert a little detail there in the Torah that none of the lambs of those first lambs were to be broken in their deaths. God had the gospel writers insert a little detail too that at Passover time when Jesus was crucified none of his bones were broken. My ancestors had to apply in faith the blood of the lambs to the door frames of their homes. Well spiritually each one of us must apply in faith the blood of the Messiah to the door frames of our heart. But think about it. Where did I tell you the blood was on those doors? That's right. Let's start some people pointed up top. That's right. You take a branch of hyssop. Now, I don't know what hyssop is. I don't know. I, you know, I'm a city guy. You're city folks. Hyssop doesn't just grow. I don't know what it is. It's some kind of leafy, branchy thing. Who knows? But we take some hyssop. It's a Middle Eastern vegetation. You dip it in the blood, and you splash that on the top of your door. What do you think is going to start happening with that blood? Well, it may get on you, but yeah, it's, yeah some of you, that's right. It's going to start dripping down. Boom, 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 right on the ground. So we're going to have a little puddle down there. And then we splashed it on the two sides. So 1,500 years, I love this. God gave us a picture of redemption. Think about it. Blood up high, down low, and on the two side posts, which prefigure the wounds of our Messiah on the cross. Amen, huh? Well, the child asks a second question. Shebechol halelot anu ochlin chametz u matzah halayla hazeh matzah. 
I know what you know what I was talking about, right? <laughs> On all other nights, we eat other, either leavened or unleavened bread. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? That's bread that's flat, like a big cracker. Well, we explain that our ancestors, in their hurry to leave the land of Egypt, had to take their bread with them while it was still flat. I'm going to start the show and tell a little more, but we want to start with this blue item called a matzotash. And inside here are three layers of unleavened bread, matzah, each separated from the others by some cloth. You can see the various compartments in there. And on Passover, the head of the house removes just the middle layer, breaks it in two. We set one half aside and the other half gets a special name. We call this the afikoman. Let me hear you say that. Afikoman. All right, can you guess what language that is? Hebrew. Nope. It was the best first guess, though, always. Huh? I hear Aramaic. No, but I didn't hear... Who said Greek? Yes. Whoever said Greek, you all go home with 10 points this morning. All right. I want you to think about this, though. It is strange that a major Jewish holiday like Passover would give a very important symbol, a Greek name, instead of either Hebrew or Aramaic. Why is that? Well... I'm not telling you right now. <laughs> I'll tell you a little later. I want you to think about it. I will tell you, though, that afikoman means that which comes or he who comes because that's what happens. We don't eat it yet. It will come later. We eat it at the end, and I have forgotten. Oh, you know what I did? I usually have a napkin here, be, uh, and, and I just recently spilled grape juice on my napkin. Yeah, can I use that? That's perfect. And so I put it in the wash last night, and I... My wife put it on a chair to dry, and I was supposed to grab it this morning, and I forgot. Well, we wrap it in, a, in a, some kind of a cloth, and this is going to do just fine. And it's hidden from view, buried. No one else at the table knows where we hide this, but later on the kids have to run around the house and find it, or you know we can't even finish up. That's the way it is. Well, now the child asks two more questions. Why on this night do we eat bitter herbs, which, by the way, do not taste too good, and why on this night do we dip our food twice? And normally, of course, you don't even dip your food once. I'm going to use this plate to help me explain. This is called a Seder plate. And, all right, you got that? I was just uh, about four, six weeks ago. You know, I grew up in a home where it was not exactly fully kosher. My dad had a taste for Canadian bacon for some reason. But... Uh, <laughs> Most of it was kosher, except that little indulgence, you know. But uh, somebody just told me, I didn't even know about this, that there's something called an oyster plate. Uh -huh. You familiar with that? Well, see, I wasn't, because they don't have kosher oysters. They don't make turkey oysters. So, uh, but we don't use it that way. We put symbolic foods into those compartments, and together they form the picture of redemption. So we're going to talk about those. The first symbol is this one called karpas, or greens. And we use parsley, and of course, as we are in springtime now, you know, the greens represent life, everything outside coming back to life. But before we eat it, we dip it into salt water, which represents the tears of life. Yeah, why do we do that? To remember that a life without redemption, isn't it so often a life that is immersed in tears? Yeah. Then there's something called the chazeret, it's the root of the bitter herb, an onion, a horseradish root, a very bitter lettuce. They all remind us that the root or the beginning of life is indeed bitter, my friends, if you start out as a slave to something. That's right, like the Jewish people were back in Egypt. Well, then we've got something called maror. This is the bitter herb itself. I'm not going to tip it too much. It'll come falling out. This is freshly ground horseradish, all right? So on Passover, your friends will follow what the rabbis say, which is to eat about a full teaspoon of the horseradish. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I just got done telling you that Passover starts tomorrow night, so not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that's what we call passing over the horseradish. <laughs> you know what happens when you eat that much horseradish? Woo. Yeah, it lights you up. But you start to cry. It just forces, it, you know, you water up and those tears come down your cheeks. 
And that's the whole point. The rabbis want to make sure everyone at the table starts crying to remember, seriously, remember how tough it was in Egypt. How terrible the conditions were. How sad it was to be in slavery back in Egypt. Well, then we have a little contrast and it cools off the palate. Something called haroset. Now you can see this is just a, a, a chopped apple. All right, this is the beginning of the recipe that's made of chopped apples, nuts, honey, cinnamon, a little bit of wine and grape juice. We, we kind of uh, chop it up, mix it up, and it becomes a brownish, grayish colored mixture that's supposed to look like the mortar that our ancestors made bricks for Pharaoh. But it tastes really sweet and really good. And people wonder, well, Stephen, why do you use a sweet mixture like that to represent such a bitter job? This is wonderful. The most bitter labor, no matter what it is, can be sweetened when God has given you a promise of redemption. Amen. 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 We need to remember that. Amen. Amen. Well, the next symbol, this one called the Chagiga. That was the name given to a special holiday sacrifice once offered in the temple in Jerusalem. On Passover, it's actually roasted, so it chars up the eggshell a little bit. We break it open. Everyone at the table gets a piece. Before we eat it, though, we dip it into salt water, which represents what? Tears. Tears. We do that because it's a token of grief to the Jewish people over the destruction of the second temple. Now, the last symbol is this one. We know what that is, right? Of course, yes, it's a bone. It's a lamb shank bone. And uh, I don't know how many of you would agree or disagree. Let's see. I'm, I never do this. I'm going to do it this morning. How many of you would agree with this statement? Well, Passover is the feast of the Passover lamb. Okay, I see. Wow, only two of you. Well, what do you know? The rest of you disagree with that? Or are you just too afraid to be wrong? <laughs> All right. Well, we're all afraid to be wrong, aren't we? That's that pride thing again. All right. <laughs> well, Passover is the feast of the Passover lamb. And it's not the feast of the Passover lamb. What am I talking about? Well, once upon a time, we did eat, pa we did eat lamb on this holiday. But guess what? Your Jewish neighbors just across the street over there, on Passover, they do not eat lamb. The rest of the year, sure, they might have lamb chops or whatever else. Not on Passover. The reason is that the lambs we once ate on this holiday were from those animals that were offered up as sacrifices. But in the year 70 A.D., the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed along with the altar where those sacrifices were performed. So from that day to this one, no animals are offered up any longer, so no lamb is on the table. Instead, similar to this egg, we just use a bone that reminds us of sacrifices that are no longer performed. But those two symbols on the table can be, if, if you think into it, so to speak, they can be a bit troubling. There's no temple, and there's no altar, and I just got done saying there's no sacrifice today. So how is it possible to atone for sin? The Torah in Leviticus is very clear. God had Moses say, I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Now, as a Jewish missionary to my people, this subject does come up. And I guarantee if I spoke with some of the folks around here, I would get one of three reactions. First reaction, Stephen, you're an idiot. Sorry to say that in church. They would say, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just ignorant. You must not have had a good Jewish education. You know, don't you know? We don't do that in Judaism. We go on Yom Kippur. We ask God to forgive us. He forgives us. You know, you don't know anything. Number two, what are you trying to deceive us? You got, you're, you're trying to like play something tricky here. You know, you're, you're, you can like double speak, you know, like a, like a snake. Or number three, pure and simple, Anger, all right? Anger. I once was in a discussion with a, a, a very famous Orthodox rabbi in Jerusalem. He's no longer alive. His name is Noah Weinberg. He was, he's, I'm telling you, he is a sage, you know, in modern Judaism. And this subject came up, and he started yelling at me. He said, you mean to tell me you think God is some type of primitive, bloodthirsty being? He said it had a different tone, really, but uh, 
I wonder how you would have responded to him. Just how would you have responded to him? You know, what do we say in the face of that? Is what I'm talking about relevant or is it irrelevant today? Well, it is relevant. Let me explain. The ancient rabbis who wrote the Haggadah, they tell all of us sitting around the table to identify with the Exodus. What am I talking about? Well, you remember what I said earlier. In the, it says in the Torah, in that day when your son asks you, why are we doing these things? You tell him, this is because of what the Lord did for me. When he brought me out of the land of Egypt. And so through every generation, we put it in the first person, and the rabbis say, identify with it, as if God were bringing you out of the land of Egypt, just like that. And so families do it in various ways, creative ways, and it's a great object lesson. But I will tell you that I think it stops short. Because not only should we identify with the Exodus, but I think we also need to identify personally with the story of redemption. Each one of us needs to be personally redeemed. But with no temple and no altar and no sacrifice, how are we going to find that redemption? The law of Moses was clear. You know, one of the questions I sometimes ask if I'm in this conversation is, who changed the rules? Who changed the rules? You know, well, 2,000 years ago, there lived a Jewish man, as you heard, uh, by the name of Yochanan. We know Yochanan is John the Baptist. And he was at the River Jordan baptizing people one day, and he saw someone else approaching. It was his cousin, a man named Yeshua, whom we know as Jesus. And what did John say when he saw Jesus? That's right. I asked that in one church, and a little kid, before anybody else said anything, said, he said, hi! But uh, <laughs> it was cute. But John, after he said hi... <laughs> He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's how redemption is possible today. Not through the blood of lambs, but through the blood of the Passover Lamb, the Lamb of God, our Messiah Jesus. Praise God. Well, let's continue. It's time for the third cup, which is, excuse me, the second cup, which is the cup of uh, plagues. And we do something with this one. Because in Jewish tradition, the fruit of the vine wine or, or grape juice, is a symbol of joy. Uh, you know, a proverb says, wine maketh the heart glad. Passover, we have four cups, lots of joy, use your imagination, but we don't get drunk. This is, we drink these over the course of many hours, you know. But uh, at this point, we actually diminish our joy a little bit because we remember for God to redeem us from slavery in Egypt, he first poured out 10 plagues on the Egyptians. And sure, they were our enemies. And they were cruel taskmasters. But they were still human beings created in God's image. And so we don't rejoice when other people suffer. So we express sorrow over their experience, loss of life, loss of property. And we diminish our joy as we dip our finger in the cup and let ten drops fall onto our plates as we recite those ten plagues together. But like I said, Passover really is a night to rejoice, to praise God and thank Him. And this morning I praise God. Not simply that he redeemed my ancestors from their slavery in Egypt, but I praise God this morning that he redeemed me from what could be called a greater slavery. Slavery to sin. That's what the Bible calls it. I was raised, as I told you, uh, in a somewhat traditional Jewish home in the Chicago area. We went to a conservative synagogue. You know, there's Orthodox, conservative, reform. We were in a conservative synagogue. So from a young age, you know, I learned, I was going to Hebrew school, learning to chant the Torah, chant the Haft Torah, you know, from the prophets for my bar mitzvah, which came up at the age of 13, and learn how to, what to eat and not eat, even though we didn't always follow it exactly. And, you know, we were an average American Jewish home. But we were not a religious, we didn't talk about God so much. We didn't read the Bible in my household. And by the time I got to high school or the middle of high school, I didn't know if there was a God. No, no. So uh, my grandmother, my Orthodox Jewish grandmother, died when I was 17. And she and I were very tight. And, you know, when you stare death in the face, it's, it's not, it's, it's troubling. It's very troubling. And I know many of you know this. And so I began to wonder, what is life? What is death? Why are we here? What's the meaning? Is it to party? I don't think so. Is it to make a lot of money? 
that's not so deep after a while, you know? So what is the meaning? I couldn't find answers. I went off to college, University of Illinois, and I wound up, interesting turn of events, but in my first semester, had a Jewish professor for a certain class, and I wound up writing a research paper for him on why the Jews at the time of Jesus did not believe he was the Messiah. Wow, I didn't know anything about that. But I had to see what did our people expect in the first century? Why didn't they think Jesus fit that portrait? So I'm reading these uh, prophecies, you know, these prophetic texts in the Old Testament that our rabbi said were about the Messiah. And I read explanations, books by Jewish authors, Christian authors, secular authors, still had so many questions. So I interviewed a couple rabbis in town. I made appointments one by one. And a couple Christian pastors in town to hear both sides. And I told an, an ex-Jewish girl, uh, no, not ex-Jewish, but ex-girlfriend who was Jewish, uh, she came to visit me. I told her what I was writing on, and she was a bit shocked, because we don't talk about Jesus in the Jewish community. And I know you know that. But she said, well, wow, what do you think? You know, what do you, and I told her, you know, I'm leaning in the direction. It might be true. Yeah. There was, there's, there's an, an invisible, there's kind of an invisible wall, though, around the Jewish community and maybe also around every Jewish person, in a sense, when it comes to Jesus. It's like, I cannot cross that wall. I cannot cross that line. Jesus is not our guy even though he is, and you know, but that's what we think. So I finished my paper, I, I uh, well, I'll wrap my story up, but about three or four months later, my girlfriend came over, Gentile girl. She's my wife now. But she came over and she said, hey, guess what happened? Jesus and I got together last night. That's exactly how she said it back in the 70s. And uh, I was 18, and I said, well, if that makes you happy, whatever. And I began to see her life change. She had been raised in a very strict Christian home, but had rebelled. And boy, through high school, because I knew her, she was wild. She was a party girl. and she, she drank a lot, and she liked to be loud at parties. And I didn't really even like her that much in high school. <laughs> but uh, I began to see her life change for the better. And uh, I began to pray, if there's a God out there, show me. If this is true about Jesus, I'm willing to find out. And I can remember in my parents' family, I, I, it was just a really bitter, not bitter, but difficult struggle inside. I was actually like a caged cat at one point, just pacing in my parents' family room because I was agitated. It seems like it's true, but it can't be because, you know, back and forth. But if you ask God those questions from your heart, and I know some of you have. He will answer, doesn't he? He says, if you seek for me with all your heart, I will be found. Yeah. And I, I, you don't want to avoid the truth if you're looking for the truth, no matter where the truth may lead you, where God may lead you. So I knew it was true. I prayed a prayer to receive Jesus into my life for the forgiveness of sins. And you know what? I want to say this with boldness this morning. It does not matter whether I'm Jewish and you're not. That is not the point. The point is faith in the Messiah, the Savior. Right? It doesn't matter what our background is because it's through faith in Him that any of us pass over from death to life. Amen. We are brothers and sisters. So, well, at this point in the ceremony, we better keep going. We only have a few hours left. All right. It's time for what we call the Shulchan Orach, that is the festive meal. We have done the first two cups. Right in this little space here, we have our big banquet meal. So how many of you, how many of you kind of skip breakfast this morning? Mm -hmm. All right, join the club, me too. And how many of you are looking forward to lunch today? Oh yeah. Well good, this is the point we all get to use our imagination. <laughs> Pretend we're having a nice meal, what you're looking forward to, whatever it may be. And I just want to give you a brief update on the ministry of Jews for Jesus. When I'm done, we'll take just a few more minutes and show you very clearly how these symbols point to a fulfillment in Christ. But if you would take out the brochure you got on the way in, does anyone need one of these, did not get one? A few. We do have extras uh, in the back if, if one of the greeters or someone else could hand those out. Thank you. Here they come. If you raise your hand, they're on their way.
All the way up to the very front pew, too. All the way to the front. Wow, okay. Well, I'll just... Yep, more up here. Thank you. Jews for Jesus is an international missionary organization. We're in 12 countries around the world. We bring the gospel to our Jewish people in all the major cities where Jewish people tend to live. My role, I've been with the ministry 22 years now. I oversee our work in the D.C., Baltimore area, as well as in the land of Israel, where I travel some three times a year, and I'm in touch with them pretty much daily. Uh, Israel is our largest branch now, praise the Lord. Do you know about 100 years ago, 2011, yeah, that would be 1911, about 100 years ago, there were somewhere between 20 to 40,000 Jews in the land of Israel. Do you know today there are 5.7 million Jewish people in the land of Israel? God is truly doing something unique and new in our lifetime. And uh, out of that 5.7 million Jewish people in Israel, native-born Israelis, those you know, who are Jewish people born in the land of Israel, there are only about 6,000 who are believers in Jesus. If you do the math, and I've done it for you, that is less than one-tenth of one percent of the Jewish Israeli population that know Jesus. And so the need is huge, brothers and sisters. And doing Jewish evangelism in Israel, as well as here, uh, I should tell you some Baltimore stories, but um, it can be very challenging. It can become volatile at times. Here in Baltimore, I mean, in Israel it gets real big, but here in Baltimore we were doing uh, on, uh, I don't know if we were on Park Heights or where we were, or if it was Reister's, no, it wasn't Reister's Town. I think it was Park Heights. We were out there and we were holding a banner, you know, and we were just trying to, get the message to the community, and some of us were going door to door. While some of us were going door to door, some young people in the neighborhood started throwing golf balls at our, I don't know, how are they getting golf? Is there a country? Yeah, there is, I guess, a country club somewhere. But anyway, they're throwing golf balls, and luckily no one, or fortunately no one was hit. While we were holding the banner, one of our folks got, got creamed with an egg from a passerby. One religious Jewish man uh, walked by and he made it clear he says you're going to burn in hell you know and some people say oh Jewish people don't believe in hell well that man certainly believed it and, and, and actually in Orthodox Judaism they do believe in a heaven and a hell in the liberal Judaism they don't but one of our volunteers believe it or not this is so funny he was a Gentile guy volunteering in this Baltimore outreach we did he was a pig farmer from Iowa Talk about it. You know, God will use anybody to reach anybody, right? But he said to me after this religious man had made that comment, he said, how ironic that that man said we were going to burn in hell while all the time we were praying that he and his community wouldn't, you know? Anyway, um, go ahead and open your brochure up. Tear off this little coupon, all right? There's a part that says the involvement section. I'm a missionary, and I'm not a salesman, but I do hope maybe I can persuade you to fill this out this morning so you can get a free newsletter from Jews for Jesus. Folks, God has you in a very strategic location when it comes to Jewish evangelism. A lot of those people in Baltimore will not talk to me because I'm a turncoat. I'm a traitor. I've joined the other team. You know, I've, I've, I've left what I should have. You are the perfect, the perfect witnesses because in their mind, I'm just telling you like it is, in their mind, you're supposed to believe in Jesus. You know, you were raised in the church. That, and, and so you, you know, they expect you to bring up Jesus. Well, why don't you do it? That would be wonderful. Because, you know, they can't blame you of being a traitor. They might say, oh, well, that's kind of you, that's nice, I'm Jewish, you know, and they'll act maybe like they know a lot more than you. Just, just overlook any arrogance that might come your way and, and show them the life of God. You don't have to have sophisticated theological answers. The blind man in John 9. All I know, folks, I was blind and now I can see. Share what God is doing in your life, and that'll make them jealous to see God at work in, it, in your life. Anyway, if you get the newsletter, 
It'll give you more Jewish roots of our Christian faith to, to broaden your understanding. It will give you stories of Jewish people coming to faith to encourage you and strengthen you. Uh, it will tell you how to pray for us as we bring the gospel to our people. So I hope that you would fill it out. It is free. Um, later, there will be a, an offering for the ministry of Jews for Jesus. But again, you don't have to put money in there as you put your card in there. The newsletter is free. If you do decide to give a gift to our ministry, just a couple of quick words. Don't take away from what you plan to give to the church this morning. Don't do that, please. Support the church first. This is your primary place of ministry. Secondly, if you're still exploring who Jesus is and you are not sure that you've given your life to him, don't give in the offering. Because uh, first, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and, and just let the offering go. But um, if you do give to Jews for Jesus this morning, it goes to bring the gospel to my people. It doesn't bring me to the church. The church does my mileage. Don't worry about that. Anything for this offering will be for uh, evangelistic purposes. Right out behind the sanctuary, there's a table that I brought materials to help equip you to share your faith as well. Half the table is free. I should have brought one, but a great little pamphlet on some pointers on sharing your faith with Jewish people. But I've got, uh, well, just take a look. I'll be back there. We can talk afterwards. A lot of stuff to help you. We're in a Sunday morning worship service. Uh, I don't often do this, but uh, before we finish up, are there one or two questions before we continue? If anybody has something that's just burning on their mind. That's fine if you don't. Just want to give you the chance. Okay. Well, we're going to finish up with about 10 more minutes of, of uh, this presentation. After the meal, it's time for this third cup, the cup of redemption. But we can't continue with that because something else is missing and we better find it first. You remember what it is? That's, wow, wow. She remembered the Greek name, the Afikoman. That's very good. I guess anybody who can memorize lyrics to a song can memorize that too. That's right. Well, it's returned to the head of the house and then broken again. Each person at the table gets a small piece about the size of an olive and that olive-sized piece will be taken with the third cup, the cup of redemption. Familiar? I hope. This moment in the Last Supper, which was a Passover Seder, is where we find the origin of our communion service. But not only that, think about it. Where else could we find a clearer picture of our Messiah Jesus than in this custom of the Afikoman? It's broken, it's buried, it's brought back. Even the matzah, which is unleavened, a symbol of a sinless nature, can speak of Christ. Our rabbis give us guidelines about every area of life, but including how we bake matzah. They say it must be pierced to inhibit any kind of leavening that might happen. I don't know if you'll be able to see the, whole, the holes in this. Well, God spoke through the Old Testament prophet, Zechariah, and he said, this is the Lord speaking, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Yeah. But I can see Jesus not only symbolically in the matzah, but also in this matzah tash. You remember the pouch? Three layers, right? We took the center one out. Well, in the Jewish community, there is so much disagreement about what this thing means. Some rabbis will tell you the three layers represent the three patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But why do we do what we do to that middle one? Well, other rabbis will say that they represent the threefold division of worship in the Jewish community. That means the priests, Levites, and the rest of the people of Israel. But why are we breaking the Levites in half? I mean, you know. <laughs> well, <clears throat> there's actually several other explanations. Rabbis will tell you, oh, it's three loaves of bread, each with a meaning. Oh, it's three crowns, it's three this. A lot of competition. But none of the explanations answer that question. Why is the middle matzah broken, buried, brought back? Well, let's see if we can answer that. I told you that afikomen is a Greek word. Actually, several of you knew that. Why a Greek word in a Jewish ceremony? Was there at any point in history, I mean, Jewish people speak Greek. I mean, excuse me, speak Hebrew, right? Not Greek. Did Jewish people ever speak Greek? What? Paul? Yeah, Paul spoke Greek, didn't he? And he wasn't the only one in his lifetime. 
You got it. In that first century era, Jewish people spoke Greek to the point where the Old Testament had been translated into Greek because we were losing touch with Hebrew. Just like American Jews, well, you give a Hebrew Bible to most American Jewish people, they won't be able to, they won't be able to understand it. They need an English Bible. We're losing touch with Hebrew here today too. Why is that? Well, <clears throat> back then, Greek was the English of today. In other words, it's the language of trade throughout the world. All over the world people learn English today. Back then it was Greek. So we know, because this is a Greek word, that this tradition must have its beginnings, it must have started in the first century era. Well, there's an explanation that comes out of that first century era that's going to answer our question. There's three layers, but inside the pouch they form a unity. And there's a Hebrew word that means that kind of unity. The word is echad, which reminds me of what God said in Deuteronomy 6, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, which means listen up, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But the word echad, which means one, throughout the scripture, when you look at it, also means a unity. And on Passover, the head of the house removes just the middle layer of that unity. It's made visible, not the other two. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Amen? And the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We Jews who know the Messiah believe that the unity of the Matzatash bears witness to the unity of one God revealed in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Why is the middle matzah broken, buried, then brought back? I know we got the picture. Because Jesus was broken at the cross for sin, buried, and brought back in resurrection. He said, this is my body which is given for you and for you, for all of us. Do this in remembrance of me. And we get to that third cup, cup of redemption. There's a good website, by the way, uh, pa uh, Pastor David, I don't know if you know it, it's called askmoses.com. It's very good for sermon prep, if you ever want something like, from a Jewish point of view, yeah? They have rabbis at askmoses.com, they have rabbis sitting there around the clock, 24-6. You can ask them any question. Now when I say 24-6, you know what day they're not there, right? <laughs> Don't try to find them on a Saturday. <clears throat> Ain't gonna happen, all right. But they're around the world, so they work shifts. And you can ask them anything about the Jewish Bible, Jewish culture, you know, things like that. Well, I went there and I asked, click, 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 instant message. Rabbi, why on Passover, which is our tradition, why do we only drink red wine, not white? The answer came back. Well, the red wine is supposed to remind us of the blood of those lambs that were slain in Egypt to redeem us from slavery. Well, in the same way, the blood of another Passover lamb, Jesus, was to redeem us from our slavery to sin, right? And Jesus spoke of this cup, which is the one after the meal, when he said, Behold, the new covenant poured out for you in my blood. He spoke of a new covenant God had promised us through Jeremiah the prophet, where he would put his Torah in our heart and forgive our sin. And he would be our God, we would become his people. The cup of redemption is taken along with the afikoman in remembrance of the blood and the body of the Passover lamb. You know, <clears throat> In half of the world's Jewish population, there's, there's kind of a, two groups of Jewish people in the world. My family and folks like us and most of the people in Baltimore are what we call Ashkenazic Jews. We, were, we, we made it up to Europe after we got kicked out of Israel once upon a time. We lived in Europe for centuries and centuries. But the Jews who stayed in the Mediterranean area, in the Arab lands and northern Africa, they're called Sephardic Jews. And they, they were buried in those places so long, their traditions are very ancient and unchanged. And listen to this. If you get a Sephardic Haggadah, when they break off that piece of afikoman, before they eat it, you can read it in there, they're all supposed to utter a phrase. And they all say, in remembrance of the lamb. And then they eat it. It's interesting. It sounds so much like what Jesus taught us to say. And, and, you know, some Jewish people, your Jewish friends, they might think, oh, Christianity is such a, I mean, oh, they drink his blood and they eat his body. It's like cannibalism. You know, they, they don't understand. But if we can remind them of the Jewish foundation upon which that rests, the rabbis say, 
the blood of the lambs, the red wine reminds us. The Sephardic Jews in remembrance of the flesh of the lamb, you know, the body of the lamb. It's, it's consistent and it's, it's, it's not paganism. It's Jewish roots of our Christian faith. Praise God. Well, our, our Passover lamb this morning is who? Yeshua. Yeshua, Jesus, that's right. Well, we get to our last cup, the cup of praise. We love a word in the church. We love a Hebrew word in the church when we sing a lot of times or when we want to exclaim something. What is that word? Why are you saying it so quietly? Hallelujah! Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God, that's right. Well, if you, want a, if you want a Hebrew lesson, that is a combination of two words. The command form for plural, meaning you all praise, hallelujah, Yah. Yah is the beginning of that Old Testament name of God, right? So, you all praise Yah. That's what it means. And this is the cup of Hallel, or the cup of praise, that as we finish up, we would normally sing from the Hallel Psalms, 113 to 118. Well, guess what? Jesus and the disciples, what does it say? They finished up their Last Supper, and they sang a song. That's right. Very ancient tradition. They were probably singing from those Psalms. But I want to close with one last cup this morning, a little different than the others. This is called the cup of Elijah, and no one drinks from this one. And you notice here, there's a whole place setting, and, and, it, and your Jewish neighbors, they're going to have a place setting at their table that no one sits at with this cup in front of it, all reserved for Elijah the prophet. Yeah. Why is that? Because according to the last guy in your Old Testament, Malachi, before the Messiah would come, he'd be preceded by the return of Eliyahu Hanavi, that is Elijah the prophet, so we send a child to the door, he opens it up, and we sing a very, what for me actually is a song filled with memories, but uh, it's, a, it's an emotional type song. I'll sing it, and I'll translate part of it for you. It goes like this. Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu Hatishbi, Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Eliyahu Hagiladi. That means soon, speedily in our day. In other words, like, hurry up already. May he come to us. With the Messiah, the son of David. And we sing this as everybody's watching the door, wondering, is this going to be the year that Elijah comes? Lots of years of praying, hoping this, expecting him, sometimes running for our lives, literally. In Europe, lots of persecution. Just, Lord, you know, will this be the year that he'll come and announce the coming of the Messiah? Well, most of you have Jewish people that you know, you know, whether it's at work, the neighborhood, who knows what the situation is. And I know something that I'm going to remind you of. At Passover, springtime, from your, the Jewish people that you know, you have never gotten a phone call like this. Oh my gosh, you're not going to believe what happened last night. Elijah came to my... No. <laughs> you don't get that phone call. You don't get that call. He never comes. 2,000 years, 3,500 years since the Exodus. He never comes. Why is that? Why? I mean, my uncle was a rabbi. You think if he's going to go anywhere, he'll go to the rabbi's house. My cousin is a rabbi. He never went to his house. We were a simple Jewish family. He would never, you know, lower himself and come to our... What, what's up with this? Elijah has already come. When Jesus spoke of the prophet John, he said, if you care to accept it, he himself is Elijah who was to come. So the forerunner of the Messiah has been here, which is a signal to the Jewish community and to us all in the world that the Messiah has come. Our Savior of both Jew and Gentile alike. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> I want to close this morning before Pastor David comes back up. And I want to switch gears slightly, just slightly. Instead of this image of Elijah coming and knocking on the door and announcing the coming, I want to think of what Jesus, our Messiah, said to us as he said he knocks on the door. You remember in Revelation, we have a quote from Jesus when he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone would hear my voice and then open the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And the, one of the big things I understand from that 
passage. And we've heard this passage so many times, I know. But I just would say that the, the imagery of eating together, we just ate a lunch together recently. And it's over a lunch where you get to know people. You laugh sometimes. You cry sometimes. You say, I've got something on my heart I just need to share. Or I want to talk about my son or my daughter, my this, my that. And we really share our lives together. I think it was to that fellowship and intimacy that Jesus invites us to do that with him. And I know that Pastor David wants to come and, and uh, broaden that invitation a little bit. And uh, so I hope that through my presentation, you can see that the Lord is speaking through the Old Testament, through all the pages, to tell us about our Messiah, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Just a powerful presentation of the gospel. You'll find no clearer picture, no more powerful declaration of what is true concerning our, our Savior, uh, Yeshua, Jesus, and wonderfully matched with, with pictures, just beautiful pictures. And, and Mind you, this, th these are given by what the scripture teaches. Amen. So it's God. God loves pictures. And so he, he wants to teach and he has taught us by way of pictures. Beautiful, beautiful pictures. What? The uh, heavens declare the glory of God. That's a picture. His glory. You, you've got to do something with that. You, you really do. Yes. <laughs> you, you can't just see this, observe it, hear it, and then go out that door and so what? Well, there is, there is a, an answer to that so what. It, it really is about being transformed by the Messiah, Jesus. Don't get hung up on his Jewish origin. Don't miss him because of that. But really focus on the reason why he came. He really did come to save you, to deliver you. I believe that was the second cup, cup of deliverance, the plagues. Right now, those of you who are outside of Jesus Christ are being plagued. You really are. And, and you're probably at times being crushed under the weight of, of your own sin Amen. that's plaguing you. And it's going to stay there. It's going to come back, or you'll get moments of what you think are relief, but you're not delivered. Those sins will ultimately destroy you. They will ultimately, ultimately destroy you eternally, away from God, away from his grace. And yes, there is a hell. That's the ultimate destruction for which Christ came to deliver us. He came to redeem us. That was the third cup of the Seder meal. He came to offer himself as your lamb in place of your sins. God's lamb, or rather, in place of your sins. 